Welcome to episode 14 of the Hellbound podcast, hosted by myself, Alex Blackburn, and Michael Chan. Michael's not here right now because he's just had a newborn baby boy, and we thought it'd be really nice for you guys to just get a flavour of what the Hellbound Horror Festival was all about a couple of years ago, and we had an amazing panel of judges, Alex Proyas, Dave Kendall, Ramsey Campbell, and the amazing Joe Alves. Now, Joe Alves is the production designer of Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Escape from New York... He also worked on Starman, he's worked with Alfred Hitchcock, Steven Spielberg and John Carpenter. So please enjoy the interview and please let us know what you think. Michael and I will endeavour to be back next week. We'll also be bringing back our fun horror based intros with Michael and I, uh, doing some voiceover artist stuff. So see you soon, bye bye. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. It's it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Well, all right. What would you like to talk about? Uh, just a little bit of everything. Oh, obviously, the uh, the book I I uh, received as a gift my birthday a couple of days ago. Oh, and, this one? Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, it's been doing quite well. It's uh, on Amazon, and it's not too expensive. They they priced it down pretty good. No, I was really, ha- I was really happy to receive it because when you when you see a book like this by, uh, about a particular film, you think, oh, it's just going to be concept art. There's no kind of narrative to it. But I think what uh, Dennis and yourself have achieved with the book, it gives a real story of the making of, which is fantastic. I think. Yeah, you know, Al, he did. We did a, a first version. Catalina Island had uh, a Jaws exhibit in their mu- museum for six months. And he did a fa- paperback, but uh, thinner than this. It had a, a great uh, display of Jaws things. Uh, Greg Nicotero, who does The Walking Dead, and they manufacture. He, he, he has the, the three characters that they made. I mean, with hair on the right and fantastic. And I had some of my originals. Uh, so that went. Uh, that was quite good. And then Dennis got uh, Titan to um, to make a new one and hardcover. And they it's, they started to lay it out. Yeah. And Dennis took over, but he did things in here that sort of surprised me. Like this is something you never see. This is a way we used to break down. A, uh, you know, a, a designer yeah. gets a script, or anybody else probably. Had. And you go through scene by scene and see what is in your department that you need to do. So he, he did that. He got that. And there's other stuff in here like, uh, oh, this is, uh, I did the, sculpted the first shark, a four foot one. And I got an ecthyologist to work with me. Oh, and brilliant. Yeah. Had detailed drawings. So basically with this book, does that most books don't do most books about movies are generally about uh, the director writer actors not too much about the people on the other side absolutely and um, so it's not really so much to, about me but the people involved my crew uh, yeah you refer to them as uh, magnificent seven don't you you're the kind of the crew close to you yeah yeah I mean Bob Bob Maddie Roy Abergas the Wood Brothers and Put together a team, and I had an ecthyologist, Leonard Capano, uh, that worked with me to get, you know, accurate and talk uh, with Ron and Valerie Taylor from Australia. You know, who were, oh, they shot the live uh, action stuff, didn't they? Shot the live action, and so I would talk to them. Valerie would look at some of our test footage and said, "You know, Joe, you you, you don't have to move the shark so much because they don't go like that. They go like that." until they strike yeah so i had really good information and uh and so that was uh, that was quite an experience uh normally as a production designer you you could oversee these things um but as i did the preliminary storyboards 
not the storyboards, but the illustrations before Stephen was on, based on the galley seats. And we had a meeting with all the, I told the story before, Marshall Green's office. But the bottom line was, Universal Effects Department said that, that they couldn't make it, would take a year and a half, and they were doing the Hindenburg, which is a bigger movie. So Marshall said, Joe, take it off the lot and do it. And normally everything in the studio system was done on the lot, you know. They did all their effects. Their oh, effects. Everything within, within, like within the that walls. structure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. this was quite unusual to put me in charge of finding somebody that could make it, getting the team together, researching. And so I had pretty much total control, and uh, which is, is good, but also bad, because if it doesn't work, you know, they blame you. Yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, and the fact it wasn't working is because uh, we started this process in the last months of uh, oh, 73, I would say, started construction probably late November, December, and seven, uh, 74, uh, February, the book came out and the studio wanted to start shooting immediately to take advantage of the book. Yeah. So basically, and I, I have to defend this, Bob and his crew didn't have a year, year and a half. They had months before, you know, and so we would go test it, basically. And I would tell Stephen, if, if, if it works, shoot it. If it doesn't, it's a test. And so people on the other side, the executives were getting upset because it took so long. And uh, how come it's not working? Well, because you started the movie a year before you should have, you know, <laughs> yeah. of course they didn't want to take any blame, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, one of the early parts of the pre-production I wanted to ask you about was the um, location scouting. Is that something you were part of uh, in terms of the production yeah. and dressing Martha's Vineyard? Exactly. The production designer, art director, it was the same title, now everybody uses our production designer. You're responsible for all the visuals, whether it's a location uh, or it, you have to build the sets. But a big production, you generally have a location manager that goes with you, so you find something you like, and then they go do the technical things, find out who owns it, what, what, you know, what they want for it, and blah, blah, blah. On Jaws, uh, since I started uh, before Stephen, just based on the galley sheets before there was a, a script. And then Stephen came aboard. So then while uh, I got Bob Maddie and his team building it, Stephen started working with, uh, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, Peter Benchley wrote the first script, but then he got Carl Gottlieb to, to work on it. So I went and scouted. And basically what I did is I met uh, Peter Benchley in New York and I asked him, where did he, sh he, he visualized his book. Yeah. And he had he, Covington, South Harbor, you know, some places on the East Coast. Uh, and so, um, and he said, uh, his parents live in Nantucket, which is off the coast there, uh, you know, off of Ma uh, Massachusetts. Anyway, um, so I took, uh, a map of the, the coast and I just started traveling everything along the coast and, and I needed two things. I needed a little village yeah. and I also needed a bay with an open view and a 25 feet of depth. This is for the, the shark Oh, the mechanism, yeah. yeah. That would sink, you know. And I've told this many times, many people know this. So basically, um, the I needed a, a small tide, two foot tide, something like that. On the east west coast, there are big tides, they're 12 feet. So, you know, if the tide's too big, you can't get the shark up. If it's too low, you see all the mechanisms. Basically, I scouted everything, and it was all covered with snow, all the beaches. You know, this was uh, December, right? And uh, eventually, I, I went to Nantucket to see his parents and uh, the weather was so bad, the boat turned around and then, cause I asked Peter, I said, what about this island? What about Martha's Vineyard? He'd never been there, but he didn't think there was much there. So I went there because I couldn't get the boat to Nantucket and went, 
and Martha's Vineyard was close, and, and I went there, and it was perfect. Uh, you know, Vineyard Haven. Yeah. Uh, um, so the and, um, you know the you know the early I think it's the second or third scene where um, uh, Brody leaves the police station, and yes. there's the music playing, and he speaks to the mayor a couple of times. It, did you do much with the sets or locations there to kind of dress them at all? Well, we did all the, you know, everything was done pretty much there. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, uh, the sets I built were pretty much Quint Shack and, and the boat. Uh, and the only thing we did in LA was we shot in a, ta in a tank at MGM, used to be the Esther Williams tank. We shot the underwater stuff with the cage and we shot the, uh, a lake it was all foggy at night. The Dreyfus goes down and he finds the, the bone and then the head sticks out, you know. Yeah. Uh, but everything else was pretty much shot uh, on the vineyard. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, just before we continue, I just wanted to thank uh, Gabby uh, for arranging this because I sent her a couple of messages and she was really, really nice to speak to on uh, Instagram. Oh, yeah, she's not here. She may pop in, you know. Yeah, it was, it was just really nice that to see you, uh, to see some photographs of your sculpting on Instagram as well. I think she's posted a few yeah. things on there. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to kind of just take it back a little bit. And um, one of our questions we've had, because we started this uh, horror festival called Hellbound, is um, how did you start? What did you start to draw when you were young? And how did you kind of get started in the business? I could always draw. Uh, you know, I had, I was born in the club foot. And so I took a, when I was growing up, uh, I wasn't too physical. Uh, I had to wear a, a, a brace, but I did spend a lot of time drawing. I could remember in the fourth grade, I drew all the seven dwarfs and they displayed them and they were pretty, pretty good. So that was my thing. It was art and music. I played the piano, had a little combo. Um, and um, so I was, a, I tell this story because it really, there was a, a girl who lived up the street, Shirley. She wasn't a girlfriend, but just a good friend. And we went down to an early evening show of American in Paris. And uh, Gene Kelly and Leslie yeah, Carroll. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we were just, I mean, I loved to dance. Even though my leg got better, I could tell my older sisters. We were just dancing. And then I, f I found out that... Uh, it wasn't made in Paris. It was all in the back lot, MGM, and in the and Cedric Gibbons and the art directors, and that's what they did. And I thought, boy, that would be a great thing to do, is to work in films and create those images. I mean, you're really f fooling the people because you're saying, I'm in Paris. No, you're not. You're in the back <laughs> lot. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, I... Uh, my first year of college, I, I studied architecture because that's what you have to, you know, that. And I studied drama. So I was in, you know, place. So I was trying to combine uh, drama and architecture. And that would be the set designers did. Yeah. And then I went to, when I was, I, I graduated high school really young. I just turned 17 a month. I was, you know, so I, my first year of college, I was 17. Then I came down to LA wanted to get into, you know, and I went to uh, Chouinard's Art Institute and it, they did, they did specialize in production designing movies. And you, know, oh, you, fantastic. Had to, yeah. you had to do architectural things and, you know, so basically as a designer, uh, you start off uh, in the studio system. Now people just start off as production designers or art directors, the same thing. But you, you start off either as a architectural draftsman, which design in the sets, of, or an illustrator that you do storyboards or illustrate what the set's going to look like. And then, so those are two departments. And I started as a set designer. But uh, is that how you? Is that something? Uh, did that? How did that lead into kind of your first TV gig? My, well, my first thing, of course, was working at Disney's uh, on the id for, uh, Thorn, I mean, for, uh, I forget the movie now, I'm losing it. Um, and um, 
wasn't uh, Forbidden Planet, was it? Forbidden Planet, yes. And I drew the id. And that was just real freaky because I, I got a summer job and, and everybody I was working for her got sick, went to the hospital. And I ended up assisting Josh Meta, who was a top effects animator. And that I did that in a few months. And normally it takes years to become an assistant. But what happened, uh, when I left Disney, I wanted to get a live action. So I, I basically worked at a little theater called the Hollywood Playhouse. And uh, we did plays, and so I did the sets, and I built up a portfolio. And then basically, you got a portfolio, you applied to the union, and uh, you walked around, and they said, okay, there's people are look, they're hiring at MGM. So you go there as a junior set designer, and I was drawing parts of the boat for Mutiny of the Bounty and things. So you graduate from that after so many times, then I ended up at Universal, became a senior, and uh, and then I worked on uh, it's a mad mad world for with Stanley Kramer. Yeah, great movie. And then to, then I was fortunate uh, to become assistant art director, and worked with some really good art directors that really taught me what to do. Frank Arrigo was uh, my sort of mentor, and he see he he came with review review came over to Universal in 1960. And in 66, then they merged. So then you had the television yeah. and the feature guys, because it used to be separated. There used to be a real, oh, you're just a television guy. Oh, you're a feature guy. But with Frank, he was uh, a television guy, but he had directed some television while he was there before you know, came, coming to Universal. So he really taught me sort of how to design as a director, you know, rather than just worry about the little architectural details. It's almost like with the story in mind at the same time. Exactly. You know, here's a set. What do we need? Well, they're looking out this window and they say, okay, so we need really an imposing window. And then there's little doors over here. So that's how you do it. So we were fortunate. We did the thing called Change of Habit. Elvis Presley's last movie. Oh, wow. And then we got Torn Curtain. Yeah, I, I have to ask you about that. How? What was your? What was the experience like on that? And working with, because uh, you've worked with some absolutely fantastic directors. Uh, well, so yeah, so. Hitchcock uh, was really interesting. Um, Hein Heckroff was a German production designer that he brought to do the ballet sequence, mm -hmm. but basically Frank and I did most of the sets, and he would. Uh, we would have coffee with donuts, you know, on the, on the set, and he would be there drinking his coffee and telling us very bad jokes. And everybody, you wore, he wore a black suit and tie. Yeah, absolutely. We wore sport coats and, you know, uh, it was quite different than the Spielberg years where everybody got, you know, T-shirts and jeans. Yeah. Um, so I had a situation with him. Um, Frank was in, in Heinrich someplace, and Peggy, his assistant, called me. He said, Mr. Hitchcock wants to talk to you, Joe. And I'm going, uh, me? Why, why not Frank? Why? No, he, he's asked for you. So I go there, and he said, uh, okay, Joe, he says, he lays out the set. This is the way the guy was. Because he, he used to be an art director when he was in England. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, because I've explained this before. Mr. Newman runs to the stairway and runs down the stairs. You build the stairway, Al Whitlock is going to do a mat shot uh, and paint that mat there. Then he comes off the stairs and he goes over to the registration desk, signs up and leaves. And so I said, okay, so then I build the registration desk and, I, and he says, yes. And he drew this thing. It was like a worm crawling over a page. He never lifted his hands, you know, it was just drew the thing for me. So I said, well, what about a reverse shot? What about over here, where it leaves? No, just build what I need. And Alec, th that is unique. Uh, very few directors do that. Most of them just say, build the whole thing, and then I'll shoot what I need or what I want, and you end up with a lot of stuff you don't see. Yeah. Uh, another also, he was, he was very, very efficient with his sets as well. Oh, Absolutely. And I, I've, I heard you uh, on a, another interview talking about um, working with John Carpenter on Escape from New York, and it was a very similar process. Exactly. Of, yeah. Yeah, I did a podcast earlier, uh, 
and Carpenter was that same way, financially making small movies, you know, uh, like Halloween. So he, uh, yeah, you, you would give him this much and that's what he would shoot. I remember saying on this other podcast, I built the section of uh, uh, Chock Full of Nuts, a building, and we built it in the desert because we couldn't afford a, a stage. And, and if you panned over here, there'd be cactus, you know. But he was very disciplined. He was very happy to get what he got, and he would use it. Uh, you know, other directors, I say, I, here's the thing, when I did Night Gallery, uh, we started off the season would be two, three, sometimes episodes in an hour. And they, the first year, they would have a director, a different director for each episode. So I'd be running around building sets and showing them. And, it, and they had very little time. So they pretty much had to shoot what I gave them, you know. Mm -hmm. But I got used to the concept of designing and building it pretty much uh, how I thought it should be shot. You know, Shork was a very interesting director. He would take what I did and he had a way of improving it slightly. And, and I, I, would, I thought quite a bit of him. And when they fired the first director, they needed a director for Jaws 2. I, I suggested uh, that they, they, they look at him. So, um, uh, so that's, yes. so your, your understanding of, uh, that experience in television really helped you get the best out of those small budgets as well as the huge budgets as well. Television is great and it's better now. I mean, even now there's so much television. Yeah. A and um, it, yeah, it was a thinking process. Well, we used a lot of, it was at the studio. There were a lot of existing sets. So you'd go in there and say, okay, uh, what, uh, what, what the producer used to do is give me a stack of scripts and say, um, how many, is there in, in these scripts, are, are there any shows that you could use the same set and just revamp it so we could schedule it that way? In other words, uh, so you could just redress it or repaint it and do it the, the next week. So uh, Jack Laird was the, uh, was the producer. Uh, so my my mind of designing sets you know was it, it was easy by the time i started doing t television we did a lot of television movies and so that was pretty much build a little bit grab what you can you know and they had incredible stock units in other words big staircases there was a staircase it was on stage 27. i had vincent price come down that on one thing and then i used it for something else so you, you had all these facilities. You don't have that now, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, it's 842. They've got a thing there. If I revamp that, you know. Didn't, so, they, do this, didn't they do the same thing with the uh, Spanish version and the American version of Dracula as well? I think they used the entirely the same sets, I think. Could have, yes. Yeah. Um, so what was... Did you... Uh, this might be might be an obvious question now, but what was it like when you started on Sugarland Express and your first kind of working relationship with Steven Spielberg. Was that, well, did you, was it, uh, obviously it was a positive experience because you worked on uh, at least three films with him. Um, so what was that experience like? Well, I had worked with him on, uh, uh, the first thing was Night Gallery. He did an episode of Night Gallery. Oh, and then there yeah. was a show called The Psychiatrist. And he did uh, two of the six. So we, we got to know each other. Now, with Stephen, on his first films, and or early films, he was a filmmaker when he was a kid. So he was used to doing everything, yeah. finding a way to shoot, put the camera, this and that. The experience on Sugarland was uh, interesting. We, we drove all over Texas finding different locations. And I just remember one instant, Bill Gilmore was a production manager who ended up becoming the production manager on Jaws, who was really responsible for, you know, getting everything to work because uh, he sort of ignored all the hot pressures from the studio. But, you know, we would drive along and, and I would see a spot and I'd say, stop. And, and I'd say to him, I remember this specifically, I said, See, we're down here and, and the whole trail of cars is up here and Goldie comes down here. So you could see that. And then you, 
you could see her and uh, and Bill would say, you know, and yeah, we're only 30 m minutes away from the base, which means you're not losing a lot of shooting time. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So we got back and Steven said, you know, I'm, I'm sort of bothered because I feel like I'm stealing from you guys. And, and it, it wasn't that, it was that he just wasn't used to working with as a group. And I think uh, it was to his, he, he really got used to that, you know, like, oh, okay. Now, he's not relying on me to show him how to, to make the movie. But uh, I said, look, I'll make suggestions, you know, and you, I'll make five of them or whatever, and you choose what you like best. Uh, and it's like showing him locations. And, and so I said, basically, that's what we do is, is we make suggestions and you choose what you want. Is that and, something, and, do you think that's something that, um because they obviously gave you some second unit uh work on jaws as well uh because it's that shot of alex kintner being you know yes uh, yeah with the, on the, yeah. yeah that was well that was one of the that was one of the parts you shot is that right yes i, I did that some of the barrel things and, and verna feels just uh, who won the editing award for that the interesting thing um yeah stephen was i gotta tell you the crew was really getting tired and I got to tell you, I was fortunate. I, I had the office. I'd go back and I'd do storyboards, talk with Stephen. So we planned every shot that was on the boat. And it sort of upsets me when people say, oh, they, we didn't use the shark much because it wasn't working. Definitely not true. Everything in the book, you see all that shot, the st yeah. uh, jaws. Uh, you can tell, you can tell by the storyboards that you were really efficient with what you were shooting because yeah. shot for shot, and I'll show you my favorite shot in, I think it's the second barrel that goes in. Uh, let's see if I can show you. I'm just gonna move my little notes out of the way. It's this shot here, it's not this shot, I'll, I'll lift this up. It's a tight shot of the shark going past when uh, Quint's just got the headband on. This one here. Oh yeah. It's a tight shot, I absolutely love that shot. Yeah, that, everyone's, yeah. everyone's exhausted on the boat. When, when I started to look through this book, which is fantastic for the storyboards especially, um, you can tell that you were like, to, to, because we're seeing it retrospectively, the storyboards, people can now see, ah, okay, when they read this book and look at these visuals, they can see all that kind of, that urban legend of, oh, it wasn't ever working, um, is complete nonsense. Well, yeah, and they say, well, we only use the barrels because the shark didn't work. Absolutely not. If you look at the early concept sketches before we had a script, there's barrels, because they talk about it. And I painted them yellow. They're normally black. But it, that's a Hitchcock thing. The barrel comes up. Boom. Where's the shark? Well, you know where the shark is if the barrel comes up. It, it's attached to that. Yeah. So that, that was what Stephen was trying to do. The same thing when Chrissy gets it. She's being waked around. Why didn't you use a shark? No, too early. We didn't want to see the shark at that time. And when the wharf goes off and turns around, well, you know it's turning around. Oh, that I've, I've got to talk about that scene. The holiday, you know? my wife's holiday roast. I love yeah. that scene. It's one of my favorites because... It, like you say, it's the, it's the barrels again. When that turns around and John Williams' music comes in, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful moment. And when, it was, um, when there was an addition, I think it was the late 90s, one of the, the uh, re-releases, they cleaned up and you could see a lot more detail in, in some of those scenes, especially the Chrissy Watkins and that particular scene. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's nice to see that it was all, all meant to be in terms of the subtlety to it. Yeah, it, it, you know, I have, it's been years and years, 45 years. And I must say this, and I've said it recently. Uh, when they had the Catalina show, and we're going to see it on the big screen outside, you know, and um, they had an amphitheater there, and the, the lady that runs the museum, uh, she introduced me and I figured, well, I don't need to see this movie again. And then she said, and then Joe's going to talk about it after the movie. 
So as I was walking, my wife said, we got a seat right here. So I watched the movie. Now, I watched the movie without thinking about my stuff, about if the shark worked or didn't work. It was so far, you know, that was always I was concerned. Laugh at the shark, whatever. But what, what Stephen did with the three characters is what made that movie. I oh, mean, absolutely. Shaw, Dreyfus, those guys going at each other, and Scheider, who didn't want to be on that damn boat. You know, he just didn't come. They were comfortable. They loved being out in the sea for different reasons. Yeah. You know, one is an axiologist who wants to study the sharks and stuff, and the other guy wanted to catch them. So I realized what an incredible movie it was uh, just from the dramatic relationships. It had nothing to do with the shark. The shark, yeah, the shark work. I mean, I love the shark. One of my favorite shots is the shark coming into the cabin. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a very, uh, it's a very I, I heard you talk about the design of that and how you got it to work and yeah. that sequence. There's uh, some early concept stuff and where you've got Hooper inside the cage and that scene you're talking about when the window breaks and he comes through, it feels he's completely naked. There's no barrier. There's he's done, you know, he's done. And it's the same thing when that mouth goes in inside the cage and he's got nowhere to go. It's such a, it's such a, um, it's, it's that final connection like uh, Brody's done for, isn't he? Yeah, well, and, and after spending so much time in that area with the three guys, suddenly this scene comes in and it occupies all the space. Yeah, you know, I mean, you say, "Oh my God, this thing is big." You, you know? get a real sense of scale. There's yeah. a there's a shot in uh, when the shark goes into I think it's called the pond before the chap in the red boat and Brody's kid uh, falls in the water when the I think it's an artist. She's got a headband. She starts to sh- uh, shout shark, shark. There's, oh, a, yeah. there's, a, there's a very quick shot of the uh, tail fin and the dorsal fin that just goes, sinks in. Yeah. And that's the, that for me, that's the first shot where you get a sense of scale and you yeah. think, Oh my God, what is I know. this? What, one of my other favorite shots is one of, one of the first shots at work because it was the, uh, let's see, it was a left to right shark. Uh, and then I would go ask Bob what's working, and he said, maybe the left or right. It's when we're high, and we see the shark just going by the boat. Yeah. And you see, oh, my God, that thing is big. It's yeah, almost absolutely. as big as the boat, you know. Because that's that's one of the most difficult things that I have, and a lot of people do. When you watch a modern film now, the sense of scale, the sense of weight on screen, I think a lot of that is lost when it goes from practical to CG. And... There's a sequence in Jurassic Park that, where the camera goes forward and the, the torch is moving uh, back and forth during the rain, where it goes from uh, Stan Winston's uh, dinosaur uh, to the CG, and that's obviously with Spielberg's experience, it's it's a ma- it's a it's a masterpiece in terms of that yeah. sequence. So when you see that sense of scale um, from that high angle of the shark going past. It's they're like tiny dots on the ocean. Then those guys are got no chance. That's what you think. Oh, no, absolutely. And and what you know, I don't have thing against CG. They just have to be disciplined. They're they're being more disciplined because because they could do it. They make it as so big, or they have a hundred sharks, or you know, uh, I I use this as an example. John Wayne coming with the cavalry. He's got 25 guys and the 100 Indians appear on the, and you say, oh boy, that means that's, you know, that's going to be pretty difficult, huh? Well, today they put 100,000 Indians up there, you know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and, uh, Lucas did this on one of the Star Wars. He just filled it with monster, you know, creatures. And it was just over the top. Yeah. I mean, how many creatures do you need? You know exactly, but, yeah. But you could do it, and they do things by just reproducing them. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, I want to ask you. This is a bit of an odd one. This is about Escape from New York because I'm, I'm a huge Carpenter fan. And uh, whose idea was it to put the chandeliers on the cars? <laughs> it was my idea. And what happened? I love was, that. Thank, thank you for that, Joe. <laughs> I uh, I said, you know, to. Uh, 
my decorator, uh, uh, and uh, I said, I want a chandelier in, in the car. And she appears with these big chandeliers. What the heck are we going to do with these? And so I said, okay, we'll put them on the fender, you know. Uh, it was really off the top, uh, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, matched, it matched Isaac Hayes' character, though. So that it kind did. of like, that use of, oh, what should we do with this? It really matched his character, didn't it? Yeah, it was sort of o over the top, but uh, it, it, as you say, it, it fit his character. And it, 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 people got really laughed. They think coming down. Well, let me tell you, though, when we started doing chases with that thing, we had to have a lot of extra chandeliers to take two <laughs> because they would break, you know. Yeah. Um, um, what was the kind of design process like for that film? And how, what was the working relationship like with uh, John Carpenter? John was, uh, as I say, well, here's, first of all, uh, they were low budget filmmakers. And, and basically the story was, uh, I had directed a lot, 85 days in second unit uh, on Jaws 2. So after that, I wanted to pursue directing, not designing. And I, I used to race formula cars, uh, like Formula 2. And so I did a movie, uh, I had a movie, a script called uh, Out in Front. And uh, Jim Brolin was going to be the, the main driver and stuff. So with Bill Gilmore, uh, my friend from Jaws, he, he was part of a company. And we went and we scouted all over Europe uh, for Formula One. Uh, we went to Monte Carlo, you know, went to England, went to the car. They, they were going to give me uh, a car to use, uh, a mule, they called it. So anyway, I, I got back. I was very excited to do this and call out in front. And the company folded or they got sold. And that was very frustrating. And then a, a, a couple of weeks later, my father died. And they just went into, you know, yeah, this business, you're up. And then you could go really into depth. So he said, Joe, I think this is Phil Gers, big agent. And he says, I think, uh, I think you should go back to work. I want to introduce you to two young filmmakers, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. So I, I met them and we were coming from a total different space. They were used to $300,000 movie. I, I was used to 20, $25 million movie. And our thinking was different. And John was a sort of laid back, you know, yeah, that's good. You know, blah, blah, blah. you know, he, he wasn't very forceful. And Deborah was quite forceful. You know, we got to get going. So I started breaking things down with, you know, and I said, okay, uh, who's doing the scouting? Where's the location? Oh, Barry Bernardi. I said, okay, Barry, have, have you found a bridge yet? Because I need a bridge that nobody uses. That I could put a wall. Uh, no, I said, well, let's start contacting the, all the film uh, uh, people, you know, all uh, commissions all over the, so uh, that was a process started. And then well, there may be a bridge in St. Louis. So we went to St. Louis and we found this bridge and that was perfect. And I built a 200 foot wall, 35 feet high. And then we found the uh, train station that nobody was using, old train station that had great texture. And then John and, and uh, uh, Larry uh, Franco, who was the first assistant, we went to New York and we went to the Twin Towers and we looked at New York and said, yeah, that's just too much to deal with, you know, because we, we were closing off New York, the yeah. concept, United States, please. Absolutely. Yeah. We found uh, the whole urban, I mean, downtown area of St. Louis that they were redoing it so we could do whatever we wanted there. So that became our base. Ah, so we called yeah. St. Louis, and we just put junk in it, you know, and uh, and the same thing uh, with the train station, and we built a big set, the exterior of the police department thing uh, in the San Fernando. Uh, San Fernando dam. Da dam, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and and then uh, the the one thing story I tell is that we had uh, an entrance pot thing that you walk to entrance uh, building. And that was just like an A-frame, and you sign in, then you walk through it. And that we built in L.A. We put it on a truck, drove it across the country, took the last ferry to Liberty Island, set it up, 
Tommy Atkins walked down the big pan shot of the Statue of Liberty, walked through there, signed it, and then walked through. And Dean Cundy, who is so incredible. Genius. One of the best cameramen I ever worked with. He's panning across the United States Police Force. If he gets to black, he cuts. We ship it back, put it on a, on a truck, go back to LA, set it up. He puts the camera, same distance, and we go from black to black. He comes out, Tommy comes out, and we're in LA. Now, there was no optical, sh it wasn't an optical shot. It was just a direct cut, black to black. Very, very clever. And, and that's the way that movie went. You know, it was, okay, I needed a, a, an airplane, a wrecked airplane. All right. So it was a, a jet, the president's jet. And I'm, I'm in Arizona, collected all these airplane pieces. And the guy says, there's a, uh, uh, DC-8, which is a good-sized plane, but a prop plane, for sale for like 5000 bucks. I said, oh, that might, where's that? And he says, in St. Louis. So how the luck of it. So we bought that. We chopped it up. We snuck it into a location at night so we didn't have to pay all these things. And basically, then you know, the um, actor walked in front. And, and that's the way the thing went, you know. I would set yeah. it up and, and John would shoot it. He, he would, what did I say? He was used to smaller movies, so when I, whatever I gave him, he, he was pretty happy with. Was it a similar thing with the wrestling ring scene? That was interesting. Uh, yeah, we, we found a location. And what I did is I put like Bob wire, not Bob wire, but uh, fence wire in that. And uh, I've never seen that before. And that's what they use in wrestling things now. All that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, link, you know. Yeah, yeah. Ch chain link. So I, I thought that was sort of funny because I just did that because I wanted him to be sort of captured in there. And then in recent years after that, I say, oh, they're using that, uh, uh, you know. In yeah, there's a, there's, there's a, I don't know what, where the design came from for the, you know, the presidential pod that looks like a, a red egg. Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, I, I, one that said we needed a pod. So the pod reminded me of an egg and I painted it orange. And uh, because the president's going to live, you know, in the pod. And, um, so, uh, yeah, that was sort of fun. And, and it was just a good contrast, you know, that bright orange and all that darkness. And one thing I got to tell you about Dean Cundey. If you look at that movie, you see it's night, but you can see stuff. You see some movies, and when it's dark, it's dark. I mean, you don't see anything. Yeah. I'm thinking, what is that about? This is movies. It's magical. You got to be able to see in the dark. It's a beautifully you know? lit film. It really is. Oh, I think he did such a good job, and you know, like some it, of those shots where the where Kurt Russell comes from uh, camera right, and you've got an overturned car, and it's all like uh, scrap metal and rubbish down the street, and the camera yeah. uh, pans across. It, the way that's lit, it, it's because you see so much detail in it now. This is the thing; he was able to photograph that movie, and it was dark and moody. But you see people walking off in the distance. And there's so many dark movies. You say, what? What's that? I can't see a damn thing. You know? Exactly, yeah. And uh, I, the, the reason I refer to the, uh, the pod, it, it was that idea is used in Air Force One with Harrison Ford because there's a pod that's fired off out of the plane towards the, the beginning of the film, but it's never used by him. So it just reminded me when I watched that for the first time with Harrison Ford of, of Escape from New York with that presidential pod and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a wonderful film. And when you watch the the 4K version of it now, it it really stands up visually. It's so strong because of your work and Dean Cundey's especially. Yeah, the uh, yeah 4K this year for uh, Jaws. They called me the early part of the year Universal, and I I did a lot of podcasts to promote their uh, their 4K. I haven't looked at it, you know, but uh, I've seen the movie so many times. It's, yeah, the it's trans just transfer is beautiful, yeah. No. Uh, there's, a, there's a shot of Adrian Barbeau's character in Escape from New York when she's dead. I think that John said that they needed it from a test screening to, to confirm that she was dead in her character. Now, the reason I mention that is 
but that was shot, I think, sometime after. Is that right? Yeah, I think they didn't have, they didn't do a, a close up of her. Was that the same process as when you shot in Martha's Vineyard swimming pool in terms of getting that shot of Ben Gardner's head in the boat? That we did in, in Verna Fields swimming Verna, pool. Yeah. 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 And, and Stephen asked me after the first screening, he says, I could get another scream if you could, you know. So we did, I built two little things because I have a, a shop. I, I build a lot of things. I mean, I like to make furniture and stuff. So I'm pretty good with tools. And uh, so we built one little section where it showed me the way to go home where the, the shark is hitting the boat and they're singing. And then you, he, he had a hose. We shot this in my, my driveway with a hose, and camera, and, and then the head, somebody stole the head out of the makeup department, and, and we went to Verna's pool, and we made this, a hall with a little hole. And I gotta tell you, uh, so the second screen, well, Zanuck and Brown, the studio, didn't know we were shooting this. And, because uh, he had borrowed the camera, stole the head, we did it in Verna's pool, <laughs> I built this stuff for nothing, just, you know, so as big as the movie is, it was also very small, very intimate. So they were saying dailies for Jaws. I went, what are they talking about? Jaws is over for a long time. There's no dailies. Well, then they saw that stuff and they go, oh, I guess, you know. And and when we saw the, the screen, the second screening, the, the audience really went crazy, you know. And I've said this before, when we used to shoot the shark, because it's made so much weird noises with the vowels and stuff, after Stephen would cut, the, the crew would laugh. You know, oh, that funny shark. I always had the fear that the audience was gonna laugh at the shark and not scream at the shark. And so when I saw that first screening, I w and, and then of course, the, the John Williams music adding Absolutely, to it. Yeah. You can see that in the dailies. And then I realized, oh my God. And the studio realized for the first time, and that's when they decided to make it a first time ever in the summer, a big release, 450 theaters. Now they do 4,000, but that was huge, you know? Yeah. So it changed the summer release. Oh, it, you know, cha it changed then, cinema. So it changed yeah. cinema, yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, so you had Jaws, and then the, a couple of years later, you had Close Encounters and Star Wars and stuff. Yeah. Well, I have um, a Star Wars Close Encounter story I want to tell you. Oh, no, please tell me. Okay. Uh, Star Wars was done primarily in England with an English art department. And uh, so I was nominated for Academy Award against Star Wars. And George Lucas came to our big set and he said, we never built anything like this. We just built the same sets and we repainted them. But it was so impressive with the, actually the effects thing. But anyway, the designer, who was English, got the American Academy Award. But, yeah. <laughs> but I got this. Yeah, that's fantastic. Which we're so thankful to the English that against an English designer, they gave me the BAFTA. So yeah, the it was a big, big moment in my life. The, the the work you did on uh, Close Encounters, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. And even things like practical effects where the dust comes in and you've got the planes at the very beginning. And it it's just a fantastic, it, it repeats really well when you watch it back. And what, Yeah, and, and the size of the stuff, you know, I mean, it, it just grew, you, you know. Let me tell you. Because I scouted Close Encounters by myself, because it was like ba basically, you know, Stephen was writing it, and I went off looking for all the different mountains, you know, and I found Devil's Tower, which is a big iconic. Uh, so it started the same way, just me scouting by myself, and then, you know, the, the crew uh, adding to it. But the, the set, the studio said you can have stage 15 and 16 to build the big set because everything's going to be on, done on the back lot. So they were thinking a very small movie. And I said, well, it doesn't look big enough. Well, Jaws came out and started to make money. And then uh, John Veach, the head of production at Columbia, said, 
boy, you guys, uh, you know, you have a big success and you think you could expand this. I said, well, I think this two stages, okay, well, I'll make a model, but I don't think it's big enough. So anyway, I made a model to fit that. And, and then uh, the, all the executives came around because Columbia really wanted a big hit. And Jaws is making more money, so we, we have more power. Nothing like relative. Absolutely. So I, I said to them, I think it's a little small. They said, how big do you think it should be? I said, you know, four times that. So I made this model. We did a lot of models. So we ended up with this huge set and I didn't have a clue where I was going to build it, you know, because it was, so we looked all over for airplane hangars and I found two of them in Mobile, Alabama and we expanded it. And, uh, so we ended up with this incredible set and everything we built, we wanted the scale. For an example, when Dreyfus and Melinda Dillon climb up the mountain to look over and see, that, was, that would be green screen today. But I built a seven story mountain on rollers that we could put in front of a front projection screen. And to this day, Stephen said early part of this, year, I got an award from the Art Director's Guild of the Lifetime Achievement. And Stephen appeared in a video saying how oh, great it is. And he said, to this day, he's never worked on a set so big. So they, it's changed. You know, the Bond movies used to make big sets. But with CGI, you just do a little bit here and you green screen it. And so you, you lost the splendor of this, you know, huge, huge sets and uh so that was an experience i don't think that they 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 do too much anymore was um uh, just to quickly go back to uh, one last little question about jaws um was the license plate during that autopsy of that shark was that a little joke towards uh, 007 because of what was on the license plate i have no idea that was steven's idea he wanted the license plate <laughs> and I, it, it was yeah i can't remember exactly but it was yeah that was funny. He throws a late, like, yeah. yeah, and they yeah. cut open the, the shark. Yeah, it's a great scene. Um, what was because uh, I, I read, I heard the story that John Carpenter put put helicopters in his film so he could fly them because he was a qualified pilot. Yeah, he was. Uh, he used to, but so what, I, I never, I never flew with him or anything. What was the, um, what was that second experience like on Starman working with him? Well, that was interesting because he wanted me to design it uh, and I was still looking for directing jobs. Uh, and so uh, I decided to do second unit and do visual uh, consultant. And so I designed some of the spaceships and uh, then I just, I did the long trips with the second unit, the, the, the car driving to the, the big, uh, uh, was it in Arizona? The, the side of the, uh, uh, you know, the crater. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a highly underrated film. It's a it's got a beautiful score to it as well, especially with the two leads. It's I'd say it's one of. I have uh, noise. Uh, yeah, no problem. Pardon? Uh, yeah, so I I would I would say it's a highly underrated uh, film of Carpenter's. It's a beautiful. It's a very romantic film, isn't it? I thought it was good, you know. Uh, I uh, it was an interesting thing. Uh, I did a spaceship in that. Um, I was telling somebody earlier today. Let me show you something. Yeah. Hold on. After working on spaceships that were wild looking, you know, over the years and close encounters, I thought the spaceship, when, you know, they arrive at the crater, the spaceship comes down. So I wanted it so you really couldn't see it. It reflected what's above and reflected. So I got a cue ball and I had it chromed. I see. So that was the spaceship. So you didn't see really. Do you know what I mean? You saw yeah, yeah, yeah. what was below and what was above. So I had a system in my chrome, get it chromed. And it never really came off the way uh, ILM, I think, 
did the effects and they sort of ignored my uh, ball. The idea, like, yeah. And they made it sort of flat. I thought by using a three dimensional thing, you know, you, you put all the images here. Uh, anyway, that's, that's what happens in the business. You get ideas, some of them work and some of them don't. So you had, you've had uh, quite a, ve quite an interesting schooling in terms of experience on TV and, and your early films and obviously Jaws and some others. So, uh, and, and you pursued directing. What was, what was that leap like when you uh, made Jaws 3? Well, it was very difficult. You know, doing the second unit on Jaws 2 for a director that I was responsible for getting in a job, I pretty was free. I, I realized how difficult it was sitting there getting shots. You know, you had to be so disciplined, waiting to get the right shot. Uh, when I got the job for Jaws 3, uh, people said, well, stay away from the art department, you know. Uh, so I went to, uh, and Jeff Corey was an actor. Uh, he was sort of in the 50s. Uh, he became a, a coach because uh, with the McCarthy thing, he had done something with, you know. Anyway, uh, a lot of people of several, Jack, uh, of several note went to see him. So, so I went and took his class just to see how he worked with actors. And uh, that was helpful. And I really sort of stayed away from the art department and just worked, focused on that. But my big problem was Alan Landsberg, who was the producer, uh, who wanted to get involved with everything. I mean, he tried to give me the first shot. Oh, you did, I said, no, I'm directing. So I had a very large first assistant, Scott Mayton, about six, five. He said, just keep him away from me. <laughs> Basically, uh, he was low budget. He didn't want to build a shark. Said he had a lot of uh, uh, stock units. So he, he stopped, yeah, stock, stock units. Uh, stock, stock footage, footage. Yeah, yeah. And so his idea was just to do it really cheap. And I sort of really expanded his thinking on it. And uh, I, was, I was quite pleased, except I didn't have final cut. So instead of the movie being two hours like the other two, he cut 25 minutes out of it so he could get five screenings instead of four screenings. And so I, I was highly criticized for expediting the film too much and taking away a lot of the personal relationships. So uh, it, it got the, the critics killed me a little bit at all, but it made a lot of money. And uh, I had. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fans of those three movies uh, were young people: Quentin Tarantino, uh, Kevin Smith, Greg Nicotero. They're all big, and by the time they were like thirteen, uh, they could go see close to uh, Jaws 3D on their own with, with glasses. So they became quite vocal about how Jaws movies the first three movies really influenced their careers so i have to take that as a bit of a compliment you know oh, absolutely though the, the critics may have killed me but there's a lot of people of that age uh you know dennis who wrote the book he's 55 greg's about 55 so they were you know 10 on jaws uh and probably 13 14 on jaws you know so what was anyway, it, 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 it all worked was it um how difficult did you find uh shooting the underwater sequences was it, was that quite a difficult thing i'm sorry the underwater uh, the underwater sequences was it quite a difficult thing to do uh, for jaws one or two or three uh, for, which for one three well what was difficult uh was the 3d camera uh alan lansberg wanted us to start shooting first of october i said we don't have a camera. We have this old camera. And uh, Jimmy Contner was a cameraman who was uh, the assistant cameraman on the first one. He, he called it the Ultra Jam because it just. So anyway, we shot a week uh, and we were having the cameras made uh, uh, in England for us 3D cameras underwater and above. So 
we shot the first week without the new cameras, and then we got them, so we had to reshoot because, of, and the convergence, boy, you, you'd go and the dailies and get the glasses and get the convergence right. It was really difficult. You, you know, the, the 3D was a, a big problem. And then, of course, the studio then wanted to throw a lot of things out in the, you know. The and the one of, thing the I kind really, of obvious, they wanted to do the obvious thing in 3D. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing that I really wanted was a shark to come right out of the audience. But let me tell you, if it was a snake, it would do it. But it had this fin. And as soon as it hits that, it jumps back. It, that's where it stops. It doesn't go any further. Mm -hmm. So with, with the dorsal fin, it didn't allow me to get the shark too much into the audience, just the nose. It was, it was, uh, it was extremely a, a difficult experience. Uh, Alan didn't make it any easier. Um, but, uh, you know, we got through it. I, I had an incredible camera crew. Uh, Jim Cotton was great. And I loved my actors, Leah Thompson. She was so cute, you know. It was her very first job. Uh, and Dennis. Yeah, you know. It's a, when, when, I, when I watched it recently, I really, really enjoyed it. It's, it's kind of, obviously, the first, the first one's always seen as, as the film. Oh, yeah. And then the sequels, I think, are much, much a lot... Uh, and like they don't get enough uh, kind of praise, and then they're, they're extremely entertaining. Especially, I, I love the third one with, I think it's uh, one the shark and the the divers inside his mouth. It's like pretty much gets swallowed whole. Oh yeah, and, it's a and, great and it was uh, you know it was a lot of difficult shoot. You know where I had the water skiers, you know, and Leah had to learn how. It's amazing, she learned how to climb up on the pyramid and and water ski. Uh, I had one scary thing where I had built this really fast fin and we were chasing the whole group of skiers. Now, this is funny because a critic said when you hit one it, that they all fall. Well, they all do. If somebody, if somebody falls, you don't drag everybody because they're all connected. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there's one critic. Why would everybody fall when one Because <laughs> you disconnect them. Anyway. Their, their spin was so fast, and the girl, th it, it, went, it turned and it hit the girl at the very end. And she was just laying there, and Roy and I would think, oh my God, we just killed somebody. You know, they took her to the, ambul the ambulance, and that was the week that uh, the Twilight Zone, they had the... the, the People died. Rick Marlowe was. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh my God, because people do die on sets, you know? Yeah. It was stunts. I've had people. So, anyway, she turned out to be okay, but that was, that was scary, you know? Absolutely. And it was, yeah, it was tricky. I got all those water skiers. They, it was good. It, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot on the water. There's, there's, when you watch it, there's a lot, there's a lot on screen. There's a, yeah. quite a lot on screen. Um, one little technical question. We've got some community questions, and that's how we'll wrap it up. For, okay. So we've got this. Um, I, I started a Hellbound Horror Festival, and I've got a few judges involved. And uh, one of them is Alex Proyas, who uh, directed The Crow and Dark City. So I'm going to yeah. ask you some community questions as well. Um, but my, first little, my last little technical question, um, was it ever, when you build a set or... Um, you create um, things that are on, for on screen. Did aspect ratio ever play into it, whether it was wide cinema scope or... Oh, well, um, you can't... Yeah. You, uh, the, the thing is, uh, well, pretty much was every widescreen. Television, you, you work at the full So you have to think yeah. about the aperture is extremely important uh, be, because that's what, you know, what you're dealing with. And... So what you what you the problem you have with widescreen is negative space. Yeah, you have two actors, and you, you know I mean I did a a thing with four actors uh, at a, on a booth, and uh, how do you get them in? And, and and when they released it on television, they cut. You didn't see half the. Is actors. that the is that the dinner scene in Jaws three? I think. Yeah, and and when they released it for television, they just chopped off uh, John Putch and Leah, you know, and they, uh, yeah. Yeah, I heard, a, I heard an in interview years ago with Sidney Pollock, 
and he talked about panning and scanning in terms of cropping the center out and yeah. it just ruins all movies and uh, tele, uh, films used to be when films like Mutiny on the Bounty and a lot of other widescreen films like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea when you see it now it's fantastic but when it used to be broadcast on television the very first shot and the last shot with the credits you would see the widescreen but the rest of the movie was cropped yeah it was cropped and and if you didn't scan it you could be have actors over here and they just cut it out and they just, yeah yeah that was uh, that was a problem uh, so we've got some community questions we put a, a little post out um and when i got this book i thought right i'll i want to make you know the we're we're taking in film submissions from all over the world we've got uh, films from turkey australia um south america uh, us and it's all horror based for the hellbound festival yeah. and so we've had uh, com uh, community questions come in so i've just got to find those okay these are little these are simple ones uh so phil who i work with at university in chester he he wanted to know uh, who were you, your influences when you were started in the business who did you kind of look, look up to oh uh well david lean uh, was I think I was it so he, he did so many incredible things, Absolutely. obviously Hitchcock, um, but I liked uh, Fellini. Uh, I liked a lot of the uh, Antonioni, uh, the uh, the foreign directors for some reason. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Fellini was very influential in his films. I think. Yeah, eight and a half is fantastic. Yeah. Um, Okay, this is a, um, a friend of mine called Leanne. She said, uh, she's asked, uh, at what point did you realize that Jaws had scared people for life? Do you know how, how the kind of generational, when they watch it, like I, I, my personal experience, when I used to watch it when I was much younger, I used, the, the opening would scare me almost more than anything else in terms of the camera going through the seaweed and everything. Yeah. And when I used to go for a shower when I was a small boy, when I closed my eyes, I just, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. When did you kind of realize the scale of how effective the film was? Well, you know, it, when I, when at that first screening and people started to scream and then over the years and people would come up to me and say, you know, I can't go in the water. So that was an initial uh, first few months. And then it sort of went away. And, then, and you know, and the, the thing is, people ask me, are you scared of sharks? Or you... I pick up a script and they say, I, I need a shark. So that's my project. Or I need a boat or I need this. So as a designer or director, those are just props. There are things that move around. And if they end up scaring somebody, you know, that was the intent but they don't necessarily scare you, you know. I mean, I was never afraid. So it, it, you're sort of removed from it. Do you, do you understand? Absolutely, yeah. And like you had that separation from Jaws for many years. And like when you said you watched it at this uh, anniversary showing, you, that yes. was the first time you really felt the effect of the film. Exactly. Because I, I, I was always worried, did the shark were right there? Did that, you know, did the blah, blah, blah. And... and but when it was so distant, when it was 40 years ago or whatever, uh, you're just, and you're sitting on a big screen, you know, again, and you sit back and say, from a director's standpoint, what really worked with the relationship with the guys, you know? And, and that was, to me, what was important. And of course, you wanted the shark to work, yeah. not to look silly, you know? Uh, which all the shots you know that were, were cut in, I think I was very pleased with. And like like you said, when you look at the storyboards, and that's the beauty of this book, uh, you get a real sense of oh, everything was planned out. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't broken to the scale that people thought. It was kind of a kind of just it's part of the law of the film now, isn't it? That that was that's like. Like, uh, not really well, true. we planned it. I sat down with Stephen and uh, I, I did some storyboards on Sugarland. And 
uh, on Close Encounters, I had a really great illustrator, uh, George Jensen, and, and he painted the illustrations so that Vilmos Zygmunt, the cameraman, uh, we could see the mothership and the lighting, and it pretty much matched what he photographed. So storyboards are done for, for content, for action, or for visual impression, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to paint them. So Steve and I would talk about every shot, and then I'd go rough and clean them up. So, uh, so that's we've got uh, we've got another question from Phil. Um, what advice would you give to new artists and filmmakers just starting out? Well, you, I have a, a, a problem with what's happening now. I talk to present day production designers that don't draw. And I think if you want to be a designer, you should draw. I think you should, as best you can, put down on paper what you visualize. And if it's, if you need a, a, a let's say a more detailed, then you find a good illustrator and you work with them. But I think the, the ability to draw uh, is part of the whole visual thing. Like, okay, let's see, we need a boat. What's the boat does it look like? Should be an old, should have a, or, you know, should have this and that, or crow's nest. And, and so you start making just rough sketches. I could show you in the book, rough sketches. You could see them, some early, early concepts. But I, I think a visual person should be able to. A lot of people just get it off the computer. Let's see, what does it look like? And, and you go and, and you get all that. that that's fine. I, I do a lot of sculptures, uh, animals. I'm doing... Uh, 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 a turtle now and I get all these different turtles and, and I look at different shapes but basically then I need to draw it then I, I'm going to build it uh, and so I make it so I that's what I highly would recommend drawing mm. uh the we've got a, a filmmaker uh Ian Rayburn and his question for you is um did you have a favorite genre of film uh to work in production wise a favorite film a favorite uh, genre of film to work in uh, during your career? I, you know, the thing is, when you're uh, designing in that time and you just, they, they say you're doing a Western or you're doing a futuristic thing. When I was doing Night Gallery, it was fun. I, I did this futuristic staircase with Vincent Price in it. And then I did a, a thing, uh, The Sins of the Father, where I had to do Barneo and, you know, uh, and... Uh, but then, you know, if I'm doing like uh, Geronimo and I'm doing a, a Western, so you get into that. I, I don't think you, I don't really have favorites. You just try to get into it. If, if you're doing a period piece, you try to adapt to that period and get there. If you're doing futuristic, uh, that's what spends your time. So there's no favorite, give me a script and I'll make that my favorite at the time, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Leanne's husband, Matthew, who uh, he said, can you write his mum a check for the dermatologist uh, because he didn't go near water for years uh, after Jaws? Yeah, I, I know. He, I had he, a... said, he told me that he, he didn't even use the sink. Are you serious? Yeah. I know somebody I had a neighbor said when he was sick, he was psychologically affected by it. Uh, I, 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 I watch some movies and I get claustrophobic. I just saw something and they put these two women in the trunk of a car and I think, oh, I can't deal with that. I, you know, that, that bothers me just, you know, claustrophobia. Um, and what, um, this is just a, a, my, my uh, little question. What do you, is a, Anything for the last 10 to 20 years that you've enjoyed? What, what are you kind of watching at the moment? What do you kind of like to uh, watch in the cinema or at home? Well, I is, there any, really, is there anything that's kind of stuck out for you? La La Land, because it reminded me when I was younger of the, you know, the, the musicals and I love the, the dancing and the music. And I grew up, with Debbie Reynolds and Doris Day and, you know, those. And so it was a change. It was suddenly threw me back to that period. And I thought they did a great job uh, of La La Land. And, um, 
But, you know, uh, I, I get all of these movies for the Academy and, uh, you know, some I'm very impressed with. Uh, th why that one just sticks out is because it was so different, you know. Because you, met, uh, when we started uh, chatting, you were saying that you love dance, and uh, yeah, I can the energy of the film and uh, the di that particular director did Whiplash as well. Is super talented. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I've got one more. I've got. Are you going to show me something? Sorry. I just want to be so I don't forget because if anybody wants any the storyboards. You could contact it on www.joealvesmovieart.com. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I'll you see that? Yeah, Joe Alves Movie Art. Because we sell, they're not that expensive, but they're copies, really good copies of the storyboards. And on, on these more expensive, I draw a real shark, I mean, an original shark. And so oh, well, like, I'm going to be buying one of those. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you go on the online, Joel's Movie Art, and, and you'll see um, storyboards and photographs and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, that's online, and we do ship to England. So, oh, fantastic. Okay, I, I, I just want to mention that. I've got, uh, I think that's great. And my, uh, my fiance, she actually asked, can you buy, can you buy prints of storyboards? And that's, that's answered that question. Oh, yeah. So and not only these, and then there is also, uh, real quick, the, the early, uh, you know, the, these here. With, yeah, that, that's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, you know, those, there's about nine of those, and they're, they're about that big, charcoals. And uh, so they're, they're reproduced quite well, so anyway. I would, I would love to see a future book of or at least uh if you did these the, the boards for escape from new york i think that would be tremendous we're a, a titan we're dealing with that right now oh fantastic uh, another thing uh dennis is dealing with is he when we first met he was going to write a jaws book and then he he started talking to me and he decided to write a biography so starting with when i was 19 at disney's in the 50s working with Hitchcock and Stephen and Mike. So it, it's really a chronicle of the, the, the time, the studio systems, and how you were, when you first hired, uh, you, you know, there was the regulars, and they would hire you when you were a young guy, and you worked until that picture was over. My Fair Lady, you did some stuff. Okay, that's over. Goodbye. You, they, so then you go to another studio. And so it... The, the, the biography reflects really the, the time and how it used to be under the studio system, where today in the 70s, you pretty much, as a designer or whatever, you have to get an agent to, to get the good jobs. And that's how it changed. Well, Joe, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've got one more question for you. But gonna, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tie it up. I'm going to stop the recording and then ask you that. And uh, it's just a little, a very small request. Uh, but uh, Joe, this has been an absolute pleasure, and um, thank you so much for your 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 hard work, uh, and obviously, especially on Jaws, and, and for me, Escape from New York. Uh, 